right, welcome everyone. I'm Dan Gerstein, I'm CEO of Gotham Ghostwriters, and welcome to the next installment of Ghostwriting Confidential, a series uh, we are hosting to pull back the curtain on the ghostwriting process, demystify things, and ultimately, um, you know, better prepare aspiring authors who are thinking about working with a ghostwriter about what to expect, uh, how the process works, um, and how to get the most from their ghost relationship. Uh, joining us today is uh, uh, our friend Peter Economy, uh, a veteran writer and ghostwriter based in San Diego. Uh, welcome, Peter. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dan. Great to be here today. Thank you. Uh, so we'd like to kind of discuss this in terms of like the, the flow of the process of working with a ghostwriter. So at the beginning, as authors are thinking about um, the, the hiring, the selection process, um, based on your experience, you know, what kind of questions should they be asking? What kind of criteria should they be applying in, in selecting a ghostwriter and partner? Right. So I, I think that, you know, one of the most important, important things is the personality of the person you're going to work with. So you want to ask them, um, ask this ghostwriter, you know, what's it going to be like working with you? Um, can you sort of tell me what it's going to look like? And that's a common question that, that you know, I get from, from uh, the people I work with, with, my clients. And they, they really want to know, you know, how much of their time is this going to take? A lot of times these people are very busy, CEOs. Um, you know, I've, I've got um, a current client I just signed last week who, you know, he's never worked with a writer before, with a ghostwriter before, never, never done a book before. This is his first time. So this was all new to him. And he just needed to know what this was going to look like um, in his life. You know, how is this going to impact him day to day, week to week? And uh, so, you know, my job is to give him a good idea of what that's going to look like. And you want to work with someone who's going to mesh with your own personality. Um, you know, and, and I think that comes a bit out of just talking to someone for a while, mm -hmm. you know, having a couple calls and perhaps even doing a test um, test run on a project. Um, a little project just to see how it works out and what it's like working with that ghostwriter. Have you had uh, an experience with a client where you started working together and after, you know, not too long, not too deep into the collaboration process, you recognize it, it wasn't recognizing, it wasn't a good match. And what did you learn from that um, that might benefit people as they're thinking about this? Right. So um, recently I had a, a project where it was brought to me by a, a literary agent, um, a client who um, she was a TV personality. She had a, a TV show maybe 20 years ago and um, was pretty clear on what she wanted as far as she thought she could do a three page proposal for a book um, for this agent. And really, you know, realistically, it's a lot bigger than a three page proposal. But um, when she had this TV show, three pages was fine. That was OK. They wanted her because she had this this platform um, and um, she was very insistent on that. And I was I was telling her, you know, with the you know, agent in the background that, um, you know, we can't just get by on three pages. A, a publisher today is not going to go on three pages um, in this situation. And we went back and forth for a while. And eventually that it just didn't work out for me or for her. Because I, I just kept insisting that, no, the agent is not going to take it forward without it being in the, in the format that they're looking for. And uh, I, we, had to, we had to just go our separate ways in that case. And, you know, as far as learning, I think, you know, you want to get to that point as soon as you can. You know, time is money um, for me and, and for my clients. I mean, as, as a, an author, um, you don't want to waste your time. You don't want to be going down some path and then have to, you know, change all over again um, six months down the road. Get, get there as quickly as you can. I think that's a learning. Yeah, that's a good segue into the question about publishing expectations. Uh, and um, do you, will you have that conversation even before you like sign a contract and start the work to sort of say, make sure you're on the same page about what your prospects are and what makes the most sense? Um, and have you, have you, you know, are you willing to lose clients because they don't have realistic expectations? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a conversation I always have before I sign a deal uh, with my clients. Um, I think, you know, the publishing industry, as you know, Dan, it has really contracted a lot as far as who they're willing to accept. You know, 20 years ago, I could get anybody signed to a book deal. 
I mean, it was like not a problem. Now the publishers want, you know, a, a publishing platform, a really strong publishing platform, which means being able to market the book themselves, the, you know, the authors, um, or, or hire a PR, you know, book PR company or whoever they, whatever gets done. But, um, so I have those, you know, expectation discussions right at the beginning. You know, I, I asked them, what's your vision for this book? What do you anticipate seeing? Do you want it to be a, um, published by one of the big publishers? Are you thinking self-publishing? You know, what path are you thinking you're going to take? And I'll walk them through that. And, and a lot of times, well, not, not a lot of times, but sometimes they'll think they can get published with the, by one of the big publishers with not much platform at all. They don't have many Twitter followers. They don't have, um, they're not doing workshops. They're not doing public speaking. They're retired. It could be um, whatever it might be. And, and I set those expe expectations up front and, and walk them through what it's going to look, look like for them. And then they can choose, you know, do I want to invest this money, this much money in this project, knowing what I know? Got it. So once you start working with a client and but before you're diving really into the writing process, um, do you, uh, well, first of all, do you, do you like to meet in person? Um, do you find that makes a big difference up front? And secondly, um, how do you kind of go about divvying up the responsibilities? Um, and having the clarity about who's responsible for what. Right. Um, well, so two parts. So the first part, I, I have met very few of my clients in person. I mean, I've done, as, as you know, as I've said, over 125 books, and I think we're getting close to 150 now. Um, but I think some fraction, maybe 5% of those books, I, I've met my my co-op, my clients, my, my collaborators, my, you know, so... That's not a necessity uh, at all. I've got clients all around the world. I've got Germany, you know, Israel, you know, you name it. They're all over the place. And Wisconsin, Michigan, I've never seen them. So, you know, Zoom, uh, and you know, it was all done by phone calls before. Now Zoom is great because you can see someone. Um, and then what was the second part of the question? I've already forgotten. Um, about sort of, you know, figuring out the, the process mm -hmm. about um, right. Who's how responsible you're gonna, for how you're going to tackle the the construction of the book do you yeah. like for example you know do you typically come up with a work plan on paper with a you know you know division of responsibilities and a timeline yeah so it's all timeline driven so yeah so i'm big on deadlines i mean i'm mm -hmm. mr deadline guy and my clients like that because they like to have some sort of something on their schedule so usually the very first step is we'll say okay it's going to be six month long project that's pretty typical to write a book six months um, and then the very first step is to have an outline, you know, what's, what's the book going to look like? What's chapter one, what's chapter two and what's going to be in it. And then we usually do a weekly call. I mean, for, for the clients that I have, we often have a weekly call where we'll work through a chapter a week. So, um, a one hour recording works out to roughly five to 7,000 words in a transcript. And I'll take that recording, um, and turn it into a chapter. So the, the division of responsibility is they're, the, they're the, the thought leader. They're the one with the ideas. So that they're responsible for making sure that I've got content. And my job is to capture the content and get it onto paper, you know, get it into a, a form that they can then edit. We can go back and forth, iterate it back and forth. So um, that's pretty clear. Our responsibilities are very clear on, on who does what. And do you have a, like a standard, like baseline writing and editing process that you like to follow and then you'll adjust it based on the the author's idiosyncrasies or do you more kind of you know do everything bespoke and just you know uh, come up with a plan based on how the author likes to work yeah um again so i'm, I'm mr flexibility as well because there's a, a range of work for me that's from someone having a complete manuscript done mm -hmm. and i'm basically doctoring it editing it making it better to there's nothing and we're, we've got to start from scratch. So, um, but I have a template essentially or, or a way of working that's pretty consistent where, again, it's these weekly calls. We do a chapter a week. Um, I, I get it transcribed, I edit it, I create a, a chapter from that. Then we iterate it back and forth. That's pretty standard. But uh, I've got a, a situation right now with a, a, a European business professor who likes to kind of write his own stuff. And so he'll write his own stuff 
And then I will take that and then we'll have a call and, and he'll kind of walk me through it. And that provides more content for me and gives me a really clear idea of what he wants. And then I'll write again, write that chapter from that. And then we iterate it, go back and forth. What's the biggest uh, misconception authors have uh, coming into the process that you kind of have to disabuse them of uh, after you start working with them? Well, I think it's the entire it's the entire publishing side of the process, the you know, getting their book into print, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of people and, you know, I, I work with some pretty high power CEOs and people like that, consultants who think that just because they're a high power CEO, some publisher is going to trip all over them just to try to sign their book. And that's just not the case. So that's the biggest expectation I have to sort of deal with is that, you know, um, we're going to have to work hard to find you a publisher. We're going to have to show them how you're going to market this book, how you're, how you're going to sell this book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not going to sell the book for you. I'm going to, you know, with you create a great book, but it's going to, they're going to look to you to sell the book. They'll send out some copies of the book. They'll send out a press release, but beyond that, they're going to expect you to sell the book. So that's sort of the, the biggest um, thing I have to walk my clients through and help them get through. So one of the challenges that, uh, uh, a lot of um, collaborations run into is, you know, um, capturing the author's voice and, and producing something that's authentic to them. Do you have any tips for uh, aspiring authors about ways they can make it easier for the writer they work with to capture their voice? Yeah, I think that, you know, the, the best way for a, a writer to capture the author's voice is to work with them. And, and talk with them. I mean, I talk with my authors a lot. And again, these weekly calls and the nature of the way I do the books where I, I'm actually interviewing them through each chapter, you know, automatically captures their voice. So if, if I was an author looking to work with someone and wanted to make sure my voice was there, I would, I would suggest, strongly suggest that they do it through an interview process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not just giving them some some handwritten stuff or, or you know, some presentations they've made to some some organization. You know, actually sit down and talk through the book with with, you know, the writer mm -hmm. and make sure that their voice is a part of that. And 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 I think the nat the voice naturally emerges in that way. And make sure you're working with a pro, you know, a, a pro um, ghostwriter who really is used to, to being to, to capturing voices. I mean, that's what I do. I mean, that's what. I've worked with my clients and that, that my number one job is to capture their voice, make sure it's them talking. And, and that when they look at the book, they can they can hear themselves as they read it. And the people that read the book go, oh, yeah, that I know that's you. You know, they're, 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 that's their voice. It's there. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, when I started off as a, a speechwriter on Capitol Hill, um, I had no formal training and I just kind of learned by trial and error and a little bit of mentorship. And I started writing speeches for my boss, a senator. And um, I would get some guidance from like the chief of staff or the communications director. And then I would have to come up with something and I wasn't mm -hmm. getting access to the principal. And I would turn in first drafts and they would get red line to heck. And <laughs> the my boss was frustrated, I was frustrating. And so I went to them and I sort of said, you know, I'm not doing the job you want me to do. And I have a really easy solution. If we can talk for 15 minutes ahead of writing the speech on a regular basis, and I started very small, 15 minutes, I said, right. then I'm gonna have a much better sense of, you know, the the substance, the tone, you know, the arguments you wanna use. And the, the first draft is gonna be much closer to what you're looking for. And I, I convinced him and then the results were, you know, much, much better. And then he's, you know, we started stretching that we would have half hour conversation. <laughs> and that, that lesson really has stayed with me when it comes to, you know, all kinds of collaborative writing It's like, you know, if you want uh, to, to make sure that the, the book, the speech, you know, the op-ed that you're writing sounds like you, you have to give the writer access um, uh, and, and, and meaningful access um, and not necessarily rely on third parties. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. That's you've got to, you know, as an author, you've got to make that time. Um, you've got to, you've got to, you know. And one of my clients, um, we, you know, he's a really busy venture capital CEO, super busy guy during the week. 
But every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific, we would have a call for an hour to work through his book. You know, that was that was when it worked for him. So he would set aside an hour during the week. It couldn't happen. He was just too busy, you know, doing what he does as a VC kind of guy. But that that works. So you got to have that. You got to give your your writer access. You've got to you know, take the time and put that in your schedule. So. Um... Once you're into the writing process, um, do you uh, have a preference in terms of, um, you know, having the author do substantial edits chapter by chapter, or do you prefer to kind of give them uh, larger chunks or even the whole manuscript before they start really diving into the editing? Yeah, I learned a lesson, um, I guess, a couple of years ago, one of my clients uh, I was the kind of author, and this was used to be, being used to working with publishers directly, who wanted to turn in the complete manuscript, all beautiful, with a bow, you know, tied up, and it was just gorgeous. But one of my clients ex explained, and he was a tech guy, he was a product guy, um, software product guy, that, you know, it's better for him, it was better for him to work with imperfect products, just to get it, you know, what, what's your first draft? You know, because I was used to making sure it was all all beautiful and done. So we we did we start I started doing it chapter by chapter, and I would send him an imperfect chapter, but it was it was good enough. Mm -hmm. you know, just like he was used to working with software products that were good enough. They weren't perfect yet. They, that they iterate them, they go back and forth and make them better. Um, and so I learned that, and this is what my process now is that, you know, I, I get a chapter done, I send it to my client. And my preference is that they they do a deep dive into it um, because again we want to capture their voice. I want to get their ideas. I want it to be you know what they want, and I want, it needs to reflect them. So I, my preference is that they do a deep dive, do a, a, a thorough edit, send it back. We iterate it a, a couple times, and it's done. But in the parallel, we're still working. I'm not just saying let's stop and do this chapter. You know, in parallel, we're still, we're still interviewing. Every week, we're interviewing another chapter, and I'm still creating new chapters as we go. And then on their own timeline, they're you know they're going through and editing. But that's my preference. That's what I like to do, and that seems to work best for, uh, with my clients. Great. All right. So, so last question: um, If you could, you know, offer one additional piece of advice to uh, authors as they're you know contemplating working with a ghostwriter. Uh, in something we haven't covered yet, what would it be? I think it's, you know, I think the most important thing is is landing on a ghostwriter that it's going to be best for you. So, you know, obviously getting a referral from a trusted friend. I mean, most of my work comes from referrals. Um, I've got projects I've done and, and someone will just out of the blue will call me or will send me an email. You know, I just got, in fact, this just happened two weeks ago. Um, you know, one of my former clients, I've done two books with her, um, said, I've got a friend that wants to do a book. Um, I'm going to introduce you right here in this email. And so um, I think getting good referrals or working with organizations that have a, a great pool of talent um, available, that's really the most important thing is getting that person, you know, vetted before you even talk to them. You know, someone you've actually who you know is going to be reliable and does this as a, as a job, and it's just not not just as a hobby or something. Got it. All right. Well, thanks, Peter. Really appreciate your time to be with us. Some great insights there. Uh, thanks to everyone who tuned in uh, live, and uh, and for those who are going to watch uh, on your own time, I hope this was helpful. Um, and uh, we'll see you next week with another of our uh, favorite ghosts um, for Ghostwriting Confidential. Uh, have a great weekend, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, Peter.